I, I, I do want to say this as we get ready to go in the word of God. Um, and it's part of where I want to go this morning for very good reason that our hearts and our prayers go out uh, to the 17 families uh, that have lost, lost a child. I can't even imagine what that is like. Can't even imagine what that's like. And then the other kids that were wounded, the reality is all of them have been scarred not just the one who were inflicted in some way uh, in the gun battle, but, um, uh, or in the shooting, should I say, but uh, psychologically they have all been scarred. And it's not just those that are in, the, in those, that school, particular school in Florida, but all across America, uh, our kids are affected. And you know, we can get into talking about gun control, we can talk about a whole lot of stuff, and that's all that's going to wind up as being political and not going anywhere. And, uh, but what I want us to do is this, is I want us to pray for those family members. Uh, they are making arrangements, burying their families. You can't imagine what that's like having to sit there or from a child that has been physically wounded and have to live with a scar as a reminder for the rest of their lives of what happened on that day that they had absolutely no control over. This world is in chaos. And uh, today, what we need more than anything else is a word from the Lord. Did y'all hear what I said? It might seem like church talk and it may seem menial when I use that phrase, but what we need today is a word from the Lord because nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. In that vein, I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And I just want to read one verse. Is that all right? Ephesians 6 and, and 10. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Listen to the word of God inspired by God at the pen of the Apostle Paul. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Can I read that one more time? Paul said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If I could tag the text today, I'd like to title it, entitle it, Strength for the Struggle. Can you say that with me? Strength for the Struggle. John Krakauer writes in his award-winning biography, Into the Wild, a story about a young man by the name of Chris McCandless. He's in his early 20s. And Chris has decided that what he wants to do is to escape the reality of the world that he lives in and, and to go into Alaska and to live in the wilderness of Alaska alone. The wilderness of Alaska alone. Chris has been bombarded with disappointments and the chaos in his world. He realizes this whole society is filled with pandemonium. And so after he graduates from college, he just decided that he was going to sell all of his possession, get rid of all the money in the bank and donate it to charity, put everything that he could in a backpack. And with just one-way ticket in his hands, he flies to Anchorage. When he got to Anchorage, even those that lived there said, what you're doing is not advisable. You're ill-prepared for this. You're not trained to live in the wilderness of Alaska. It's no joke. They wouldn't even do it themselves with just a meager amount of food, uncooked rice, no money, and a small weapon or gun. He took off into a 40-mile track into the National Forest and then from the National Forest into the wilderness of Alaska alone. Four months after being in the wilderness, there were three moose hunters that 
came to an old lodge that had been vacated 30 years ago and there was an abandoned bus there. And they looked inside the bus because of the stench inside the bus and they found Chris's decomposed body still in his sleeping bag. They estimated that he had been deceased for about two and a half weeks. He had died of starvation and then he froze to death. But before Chris died, he wrote a handwritten note with simply two words on it and put it on the door of the bus. Two words, need help. Need help. Just two words, need help. How many of you all have felt like in your desperation, living in this chaotic world, bombarded with problems, overwhelmed by circumstances, that I just want to get away. <laughs> I just want to get away from it all. I, I just want to leave it all behind. It, this stuff doesn't matter anymore. I want to be by myself. And you search for that isolation. But when you get there, you really haven't escaped all of your problems. And the reality at the, reality at the end of the day, we all need help. We live in this world of conflict, in constant conflict. Earthquakes, there's mudslides, wildfires, hurricanes, wars, terrorism, school shootings, church shootings, racism, classism, sexism disease. It's all around us. And here's the reality. It doesn't even make any difference how close you are to God. Trouble is an inescapable reality. Just because you got faith in God doesn't mean that we are exempt from troubles and calamity. And we ask this question today. Is there any help? Is there any help? Look at Ephesians 6 and 10 today. Maybe from the word of God we, we find that there is some help. The apostle Paul says, finally, my brethren. Finally is the word that he uses. First, we need to understand this letter that Paul writes to what seems like a small and insignificant group of believers. They're living under Greek influence and been categorized religiously as Gentiles. The Ephesians are not familiar with you, if you will, with Jewish customs, the, the Mosaic law and the rites of the Torah. They're not familiar with temple worship. And so Paul relates to them on the basis in which they can understand. Paul has to remind them in his thesis in this letter of this, this one theme, if you will, and that is life in Christ. He starts off in chapter 1 saying, we have been redeemed by Christ. God gives this cosmic plan of redemption that not only exists then, but it was uh, determined pre or before time, and it existed then, and it even exists now and even for the future. In chapter 2, Paul reminds them that it was by the blood of Jesus Christ that he saved us in our sins and we're saved by grace and grace alone. Chapter 3, he talks about and describes a life that is lived in Christ. Chapter 4, he says, this is what it looks like in the spirit of Christ versus walking in the spirit of the flesh. Chapter 4, he says, here's the practical realities of living in Christ. Husband and wife in Christ. This is what it looks like in the marriage. Chapter 6, in the beginning, children, submit yourselves unto your parents. And parents, don't provoke your children. This is the family life in Christ. And then Paul says, finally. Like a good preacher, he says, I'm getting ready to close now. Finally, like a doctoral candidate writing his dissertation, he comes to the conclusion and says, finally, finally. But it's much deeper than just closing in conclusion. 
The word Paul uses for finally is, it, it doesn't just allude to the foregone matter. Uh, so no, in other words, I said this in the main body of the text and now I'm about to close and here are the parting words. No, 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 no. The word finally could be better described by the word henceforth. Henceforth really means from this point on, from this point forward, there's something that you need to know. We talked about that, uh, what I've written in the past, that per, per, uh, pertains to the present, but there's something that is radically important that I need to address. So finally, Paul says, You've received the word of God from a doctrinal position. You received the word of God from the standards of practical Christian living. Now let me tell you this, Paul says, life in Christ ain't peaches and cream. Paul says, finally, my brother, let me tell you something you need to know. It's time to suit up for battle. We're engaged in spiritual warfare. We've got an adversary. Listen to the conflict that Paul describes. Paul was saying again that, that, that when, when you live your life in Christ, you've got many benefits, but you are a walking, living, breathing target. He said, don't fool yourself. We got this adversary. He's an accuser of the brethren, an accuser of the people of God. And he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may, may devour. And at the other hand, he's a cunning, crafty snake, deceiving anyone who will give him the attention. The church is under attack. This world is under attack. But the church is at the center of this attack. The world is in a chaotic state. There's total and mass confusion and nobody can figure out what's going on. <laughs> but Paul says, I know. I know what's going on. I know the root of our problems. Here's what Paul says further in the letter. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. There is spiritual wickedness in the high places. I wish I knew somebody knew where the high places were. Notice what Paul says, for we do not wrestle, that's hand-to-hand -hand combat, against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle, if you will, against the dynamics of, in the natural and the physical, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul is giving us the inside scoop, church. He says, I'm telling you something that sociologists have not figured out. Psychologists dare to examine, and politicians, if they knew it, they wouldn't mention it. While everybody else is trying to figure out what's going on in this world, trying to examine minds of shooters, and trying to figure out why they do what they do, Paul says, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. I'm going to tell you the root of the problem is spiritual warfare that is launched and it originates in the heavenly places in spiritual wickedness. It's something you got to understand, body of Christ. Your problems didn't begin in your living room. Your problems didn't begin in your bedroom. The problems of that disease didn't begin in your body. The problem with terrorism and, and with murder, it didn't begin with some in somebody's basement or in the Middle East, in, Middle East in some cave. The problems in our country didn't start in the White House. They started in the heavenly places. That's where they originated. This is spiritual warfare. Listen to me carefully. And if it's of spiritual warfare in the spiritual places and originates in the spiritual places, why are we trying to deal with them on an earthly manner? This is what we got to learn. That if it originates in the heavenly places, then you got to do battle in the heavenly places. If it originates with spiritual origin, and it, you have to engage in spiritual warfare. You can't deal with it on earthly terms. 
You can't deal with it on a natural basis. You'll never figure out on a natural basis why people do what they do that is so wicked. And no one wants to say that they're possessed. They're demonically obsessed. They're workers of iniquity. They're just not insane. They're just not terrorists that don't like the country. They're evil. Good pe people who can be forgiven, but they're evil. And it's the evil scheme and plan. The devil is throwing fiery darts at you. And you can't play around and keep trying to read psychological journals to figure this out. There ain't enough sociological degrees in this world. All of those things have their place, but they don't get to the root of the problem. Let's get this straight. The devil could care less about what kind of car you drive. <laughs> the devil could care less whether you got a big house or you're homeless. The devil could care less whether you are sick or whether you are well, whether you are broke or you are filthy rich. He could care less whether you got a boo in a great relationship or your relationship is torn and severed all to pieces. He could care less about any of that stuff. He cares about this one thing. What do you think about God in the end? Our adversary is an accuser of the brethren. The psalmist said it this way in Psalms 42 and 10, as with a deadly wound in my bones, that's how he felt, as with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? That's the number one question. The same people who don't want God in the school are now praying outside the school for the school. Are the same people who are asking the question and they're directing it toward Christians is if you say that you believe in God, how can a good God allow something like this to happen? And we're shrugging our shoulders like, I don't know. I don't know. But we start talking using circular reasoning and Christian cliches. Everybody want to hear about God is good and all the time God and, and, and good all the time. No, 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 no. The question is where is your God in the midst of all of this? And even when we are attacked spiritually, when the enemy attacks our body, it's a spiritual attack. He wants us to dismiss our God. You remember the story of Job? The, 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 the problem then began when Job lost his possessions. The problem then began when Job lost his health. There was a meeting in the heavenly, in the spiritual realm. And Satan came before God and God said, have you considered my servant Job that he is a perfect and upright man? There's none like him. And, Job's, and, the, and Satan said, I've considered him, but there is a problem. Does Job fear you for nothing? In other words, there's a reason why Job respects you and he honors you. And he said, here's the reason why. Because you put a hedge around him. Not only him, but him and his household and all that he has. You bless the hand, his hands and, and the fruit of his labor and his possessions increase. And Satan says to God, but stretch out your hand now and touch all that he has. And this is what Satan said. And I guarantee you he'll curse you to your face. Satan said, you've blessed this boy so prosperously. You've protected him from everything and his family. He is only into you for what you can do for him and what you, can for, and what you have given him. He said, I guarantee you take all of that away. Then the question will be, now where is God? 
Where is God in my calamity? Where is God in my tragedy? And just a few verses later, we hear these words of Job. The Lord God giveth. Y'all like that part, right? But notice what he also said. And the Lord God, same God, taketh away. And this is what he says. And I can't find a bad thing to say about him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is given, he is taken away. Now, he has absolute control. He is absolutely sovereign. That's why the enemy is attacking us. That's why we're being attacked. And the question is, where is the church? Where are the believers and where's our mindset? Where are our values and where's our heart? And Paul says, finally, <laughs> finally, I need to let you know that we're engaged in spiritual warfare. This thing is serious. Finally, I've talked about your great high calling. I've talked about the doctrines and the precepts of the gospel. That's necessary, but finally I need to let you know as well there's a fight going on. And you better learn how to fight. Somebody say fight. fight. Paul said in order to fight, you got to be strong. You got to be able to take a stand. So Paul moves from finally and he says, listen, finally my brethren be strong. That's the command. We go from the conflict that Paul talks about to now the command. Be strong. You got to be strong. If you're not strong, you're going to fall flat on your face. Be strong. But notice Paul didn't say, go out and do some push-ups, hit the road, get, get your road march and your road run in. He didn't say, get up on the pull-up bars and chin up. No, 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 no. Not like we would do in natural warfare. No, he didn't say, load up the guns and, and put gas in the tank. No, no, no. He didn't say, let's get our Air Force together and our Navy. No, no. Paul says, listen, be strong. You're going to need strength. It's an imperative. It's a command. Be strong. But he wasn't telling them to get stronger in your own strength. Because the command, the words to be strong in the original, in the Greek, it means to be empowered. It means to be in power. In other words, there is a power outside of our own that is bestowed upon us that we need to submit ourselves to the one who possesses the power so that we can be empowered, bestowed upon, be empowered. <laughs> you better not get out here and try to engage in spiritual warfare and fight using natural tactics or standing on our own strength. That's the reason why some of us are failing in this walk. We're failing in this life. But the question is, whose strength is it, Paul? Paul says, notice, it's simple. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Did y'all catch that? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's the Lord's Strength. It's the Lord's power. It doesn't belong to us. It is his. It is possessive. He's the definite article in this text. It is his strength. So let me ask you a question. Whatever it is you're going through, you want to try to fight this on your own? Or you want to fight it in the Lord's strength? You, you want to try to fight it on your own and then ask the Lord to help you out like it's a tag team match? Give a brother a chance to catch his breath and I'll jump back in? Or you want to fight in the Lord's strength? I, I like the Lord's strength. Isaiah the prophet wrote about the Lord's strength in, in Isaiah 40 and 28. And this is how he said it. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. He doesn't get tired. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. Did y'all hear that? He gives power to the weak. To those who have no might, he increases strength. Y'all hear that? Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Have y'all seen that? 
and the young men shall utterly fall. Have you seen that? Full of vim and vigor, but they're not fit for spiritual warfare. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Look at the, the possibilities. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. <laughs> It's that same strength of the Lord that reached out into the abyss of nothingness and created everything. The same strength of the Lord that separated from day and light and from water and dry land. That same strength of the Lord that caused Israel, the minority, unskilled warriors to defeat all of their enemies. That same strength of the Lord that caused his son to be risen out of the grave on the third day. That's the strength that he's talking about. That's the strength that he's talking about. Ask David about the Lord's strength. David said it this way in 1 Samuel 30 and 6. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. He was distressed because the soul of all the peoples were grieved. Every man for, uh, for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He strengthened himself in the Lord, his God, even Paul, the apostle. He got weak, he got weary. He was being physically and emotionally and spiritually attacked. And he wrote to Timothy to tell him, <clears throat> you got to be prepared, son. Second Timothy 4, 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Not only that, but look at the bottom of the verse. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Be strong in the Lord. And the power of his might. Somebody shout his might. his might. But listen to me carefully. Y'all listening? Come closer. It's the Lord's strength because it's the Lord's armor. The manifestation of the Lord's strength is the equipping of his armor. That's why Paul uses this metaphor. The armor Paul describes in chapter 6, in the lower part of chapter 6, they're not pieces designed to be handed to us. Church, listen to me carefully. You can't pick what piece of armament you want to equip yourself with. Oh, today, because the devil keep messing with me, I want the sword or the spear because I'm going to work and I'm going to slice and dice somebody on the job. Uh, the, the Lord is messing with my mind and so therefore I want the helmet of salvation today uh, oh I'm being attacked by the enemy trying to hit me in my heart where it really hurts at and so therefore I'm going to put on a breastplate of right you can't pick and choose which armament you're going to put on today that's why Paul says put on the whole armament of God here's the reason why the armament is not just the property of the Lord that's designed to be dispensed, but it's Christ himself designed to be embodied. <laughs> Y'all didn't catch that right there. I need to go to a church that they know what I'm talking about. I'm going to say it again. They're not pieces of equipment that belongs to the Lord to be dispensed. But the reason why he says put on the whole armor of God it's because he's talking about putting on all of God or all of Christ. And so Christ is to be embodied. Maybe you need some biblical evidence for that. For instance, if you take each piece, y'all ready to walk with me? Take each piece of the spiritual armor, the helmet of salvation. The reason why the helmet of salvation belongs to the Lord is because salvation belongs to the Lord. <laughs> the word of God said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Jesus is not just the savior. The essence of who he is, is salvation. Yeah, did y'all get that right there? And so therefore, you can't separate the helmet of salvation from who he is because he is savior and salvation. I, I wish I had a witness here. Anybody missionary Baptist up in here? The breastplate of righteousness is his breastplate. Here's the reason why. 
for he is our righteousness. Paul said to the Philippians, he said it this way, and be not found in him having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Do y'all get that? Through faith in Christ, the righteousness. Christ is our righteousness, which is from God by faith. <laughs> His righteousness. This girdle of truth. You just can't say, I, I want to be girded in truth. I want truth around my waist. No, 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 no. And not unless you've got Christ. Here's the reason why, because the belt of truth belongs to Christ because truth is Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Did y'all catch that right there? You cannot have the armament of truth stand in truth, not unless you've got Christ. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The reason why the armament that goes around the feet described by Paul is the gospel of peace. Listen, it's because it is his gospel. Paul says, if I preach another gospel, uh, be, be it far from me. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed, not of the gospel of Paul, not of the gospel of Calvin, not of the gospel of body of Christ, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Y'all done, done with me, I can tell. It's the shield of faith. And the reason why it's his shield of faith, because it is in him that we are putting our faith in. Because the word of God says there's one faith, one, uh, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. He is all that we believe in. We put our all in him, and therefore he becomes our shield. Last piece. The sword of the spirit. Well, who is this spirit <laughs> other than Christ himself, the living word of God? And just like the writer says, is that the spirit, the word of God, is alive and life-giving and sharper than any two-edged sword. And listen, and piercing and dividing between spirit and soul and between, between joint and marrow. You can't separate the armament from who he is, but you need all of the armament in order to have all of his strength because you need all of him because he is his armament. Got a better response from the 8 o'clock service. Just thought I'd let you know. Now, now I'm about to say something and I don't want you to be offended by it. Listen to me carefully. So don't get upset, don't write me, don't call me, all right? I had my number changed anyway, but if you want my new number, 777-9311. <laughs> me a message if I don't answer. Here's what I wanna say, now don't, don't get upset. This strength is not promised to everybody. A lot of folks just think they can hear the sermon like this and like, that's what I'm talking about. I'm about to leave up here and bust the devil in the face. No. Paul says specifically who the strength is given to, who it is promised to. Listen, verse 10 again. Finally, my brethren. Did y'all catch that right there? Finally, my brethren. Finally, you can say my sister. Finally, in other words, finally, child of God. It, it, just in case you're confused, you had to go back to the beginning of the letter and look at his introduction. He not only talks about who he is in Christ, but notice what he says in Ephesians 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Then he says, this is who I'm speaking to. This is who I'm addressing this letter to. This is only the ones, the recipients of the letter, who the letter and the benefits of the letter apply to, to the saints. To the saints, to the saints there in Ephesus, and notice not just the saints and faithful in Jesus Christ. Those who are not just saints, you're not just saved, but you're faithful. Somebody shout faithful in Christ Jesus. Notice what he says, grace to you, God's grace, God's strength to you and peace. But notice what he says from God, listen to this our father 
I hate to disappoint you, but he ain't everybody's father. He's the saint's father, the brother's father, the cheering's father. From God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He ain't Lord to everybody, but he's Lord over everything. Now don't get mad with me because I'm giving you the gospel. You don't have to leave mad, but you do have to leave. Paul says that God desires to give you his strength but it's not promised to everybody. It's promised to the believer. Those who are faithful in Christ. Matter of fact, you go to the Old Testament, the Second Chronicles 16 and 9, I'm, I'm going to show you just, just how willingly God is willing to give you his strength. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong to show he's looking for weak people, people who have been uh, under adverse conditions, people who have, like Paul, have come down with this thorn in the flesh and you're about to give up and throw in the towel. His eyes are going to and fro. He sees you. He knows who you are. And listen what he desires to do, to show himself strong. He said to Paul, my strength is made perfect in your weakness, bruh. He desires to show himself strong. Why are we trying to fake it as Christians to pretend that we're so strong? Just be weak so that we can receive God's strength. You can't get his strength until you become vulnerable and transparent to him and say, I can't do this anymore. And then he can say, but my grace is sufficient. He wants to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? It ain't to everybody, but for those whose hearts are loyal to him. Can I stretch this out a little bit further? Yeah. Let's go a little farther out and a little deeper down. Put your waiters on. He promised strength to the believers, but I need to put an addendum and a clause in here. But it ain't even to all the believers. Notice what the text says. <laughs> In verse 10 again, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Did y'all catch that? In other words, there may be some who believe in Christ. You might be saved, but the question is, are you in the Lord? Some of y'all are going to catch that by Thursday, I guarantee are you in the Lord? I believe in God, but are you in Christ? Are you walking in Christ? Are you intentional about your prayer life in Christ, your devotional time with Christ? Are you reading and studying the word about Christ? Are you serving Christ? Are you obedient to the will of Christ? Are you serving others in Jesus' name? Are you telling others about that? Then he says, for those who are in Christ, you've got his strength. Now, now, here's the reason why, here's the reason why you have to first be a believer and be in Christ. That's the clause and condition if you want the strength of the Lord. Here's the reason why. Because the strength of the Lord is contained in his armament, but the armament is actually who he is. And so that his armament can't be separated from the essence of who he is. We covered that. Isn't that right? And so therefore, listen to this, you have to, you have to be one of his and be in him if you're going to receive his strength. Here's the reason why. He will not give his enemy his armament. <laughs> Some of y'all are going to catch that. He's not going to give his enemy his arm. If you are not in him, then you are against him. Why in the world would he give you his strength and you still on the devil's side? Why would he make you strong? Because he's going to use your calamity. He's going to use the weight of the world that's on you to bring you down to nothing like he does for all of us so that we'll come to a place of surrender to his lordship. So why would he make you strong and you miss the opportunity for salvation and to be in him? You don't give the enemy your secrets. You don't give the enemy your weaponry. But there's another reason why we have to be in the Lord. 
Remember that the strength of the Lord belongs to the Lord. Listen to this carefully. That the strength of the Lord is administered through the armor of Christ. But Christ doesn't hand us his armament. He doesn't hand us his armament because he is the armament. Listen. And so therefore, he is wearing his armament at all times. He is wearing salvation because he is our savior. He is wearing faith because we put our faith in him. He is wearing peace in the gospel because he is the good news and he is our peace. Y'all, y'all get it? And so therefore, because he is wearing it in order to get it, you've got to get in him. And when you're in him, he covers you, and so therefore you are automatically equipped with the armament, the whole armor of God, because you got the whole of God. Some of y'all are going to get that. I don't know if you know this, and I'm going to close, and we're going to get on out of here. I'm tired, church. Did you know that when you are in Christ, there are some in him benefits. I, I, I was reading his, through his in him benefits package. Uh, it was in human resources. And I opened up the book and I went to a section in Acts 17, 28. And this is what I read about the benefit of those who are in him. For in him we live. We move and have our being in him. Y'all don't catch that benefit right there. Boy, y'all are sleepy, tired church today. For in him, we live and move and have our being. Did y'all get that? And then I flipped over in the benefits package and I saw this in section called Ephesians 1.4. And it read like this, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's how he sees us. He has chosen us in him. Then I flipped over to Romans 3 and 24 in the section of the benefits. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. I've been redeemed because of the benefits that are in him. Romans 8 and 1. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. You can't condemn me because he has forgiven me. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We got any alive folk in Christ in here? Put your hands together. How many folk know you got the victory in the benefits package? 2 Corinthians 2, 14, now thanks be unto God, which always, somebody shout always, causes us to triumph in Christ. In Christ, we triumph. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, y'all not catching this, he is a new creature. You can bring up my past if you want to me, but he's already forgotten about it. You can dig it up if you want to, but it's already been cleansed. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new in Christ. Jesus said it this way in John 15, 7, in the benefits package. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you ask for whatever you desire, and it shall be done to you. That's a great benefit right there. And even in the final days and the conclusion, listen to the benefits in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ. Did, did I hear what I said? Those who died in Christ now live in Christ. Oh, what a benefits package. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I feel my help coming on. <laughs> Somebody asked me not long ago, how did, Calvin, how do you know we've got the victory? I'm going to give you the shorter version of that answer. The reason why we know is because I read the book. <laughs> Even years ago, I started reading the book. I went back to the beginning of the book. 
read the first page of the book. And the first page opened up like this in the story. In the beginning, God. I said, "Uh uh-huh, I like that already. God created heaven and earth. I said, I'm liking this. And then I turned to the next page in the book. And I heard God say, the day you sin, you will surely die. I said, okay, that's reasonable. I turned the page, and the next thing I read was, and by the sweat of your brow, you shall work all the days of your life, and in in pain you shall bear children, and serpent, you are cursed, and shall crawl on your belly all the days of your life. I said, now something went wrong right here. I flipped the next page, and the story is starting to look a little sour. One brother killed another brother. I flipped a few pages over and there's wars and rumors of wars. There's pestilence and disease and famine. I said, oh my God. And you know I ain't a strong reader. So this is what I did. I cheated, I went to the end of the story. (laughs) Woo, thank you Jesus. I went to the back of the book, (laughs) Dink. Went to the back of the book in Revelation chapter five. And it's in Revelation chapter 5. I saw the picture of those that had been living in the earth. And there were the 24 elders gathered around the throne of God. And there at the throne of God was the Lamb of God. And the word of God says, and they all bowed down and worshipped him. And they said, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, who was worthy of all praise and honor. I said, wait a minute. I missed something. Wars, conflict, disease, and now he's already got the victory. Something happened. So I went to the middle of the book. And it's in the middle of the book where I see them. They led my Savior to Golgotha's hill. It's there at Calvary where they drove the nails in his hand. It is there where they drove the nails in his feet. Somebody know the story. It's there where they took the spear and pierced him in his side. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. They took him down and buried him in a grave. But on the third day, church, I wish I had a witness. He rose up with all power in his hand. I say, there it is, right there. I said, our God is worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy. He's worthy. I said, He's worthy, church. Ain't the Lord worthy? Ain't the Lord worthy? Woo! Worthy is the Lamb. You say, How do I know we've got the victory? Because I read the end of the story. <laughs> And in the end of the story, he won. And if he won, we won as well. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through Christ Jesus. <laughs> Let me say this. A few weeks ago, I was watching on the news in my hometown, right outside Detroit in Pontiac, Michigan, where there was a demolition team that was hired to take down the Silver Dome. Once was the largest dome in America. Sporting events, major sporting events and concerts have been there. It was there, it was the home of the Pistons for a while and home of the Lions. And the contractors came in and set all their dynamite and explosives around the stadium and in the stadium and in the pillars to hold up the structure. And when they stood back, spectators had come from everywhere to watch the Silver Dome be imploded. And when they finally switched the switch, the building smoked, but it did not fall. One man stood there as a spectator in his comment and said, is that it? (laughs) They asked the contractors, what happened? He said, it must have been a shortage in the wiring somewhere. I got news for you. I know you've been standing and you're standing tall. God has done some amazing and incredible things in your life. And the devil has decided he don't just want to explode your life, he wants to implode your life from the inside out. But at Calvary some 2,000 years ago, God set up a short circuit in the death of his son. Woo! You might smoke every now and then. (laughs) You might shake every now and then. 
But in the end, the devil stands back and says, is that it? <laughs> is that the best I can do? Is that all we're going to get out of it? Because God is the one who's going to see you through. We've got help. We've got help. We've got strength. And that strength is in the Lord. God is a way maker. Have I got a witness, church? He is a way maker. He is a way maker. And if you're here today, I might have made you mad earlier. But when I said he doesn't give this benefits to everybody. But let me come back and give you this invitation. Listen to this carefully. There's one key word in here I want you to listen to. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him. Did y'all catch that? That's where we start. When you believe in him, you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The question today is, are you willing to believe in him? Are you willing to trust in him? Are you willing to give him your life? What a great exchange. Our lives for his life. Jesus says those who seek to save their life, in the end you wind up losing it. But those who are willing to sacrifice their life for my sake, you gain it. One theologian said, if you aim for this world, you'll miss not only this world, but you'll miss out on heaven as well. But if you aim for heaven, you'll get the world thrown in as well. Why don't you trust them? Why don't you trust them? Let us bow our heads.